Kozor Descent into Madness features 43 full color pages of intricately detailed art that tells a nightmare fueled story of foul demons, abundant bloodshed, and the insidious corruption of a warrior's psyche. The story centers around a mighty warrior named Chief Baron and his clan of savage swordsmen who embark on a quest into the sacred swamplands of Nimla in search for the mysterious faceless people, a race of submissive super soldiers who will balance out the odds in a ruthless war between man and demon. But when they're attacked by a flock of flying beasts, their journey proves more fatal than they could have ever imagined. In this campaign, backers get no less than the definitive edition of Kozor Descent into Madness, which comes complete with refined edits, additional story pages, retouched interior artwork, and new wraparound covers. If you're a fan of dark fantasy and medieval horror, this book is for you. Back Kozor Descent into Madness today, only on Indiegogo. Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from HowToDrawComics.net and welcome to today's comic art demonstration. In this video, I'm going to be working on a cover for a comic book project that me and my brother Corey are putting together called Kozor. So far, if you've watched the previous video in this series, we've drawn up a very rough, very loose penciled draft for this double page front to back wrap around cover for the remastered version of Kozo Descent into Madness. So essentially the concept is now complete. I know exactly where everything sits, how it's going to be composed, what the main elements are that are going to be featured within the cover. And now what I'd like to do before I jump into the inks is I'd just like to tighten that sketch up into something which is a little more defined because even though most of the information that I need to be there is present, it's still a little vague. There's not enough detail there for me to confidently go in with the inks and just start working. I'm going to be guessing a lot and I really don't want to be in that headspace when it comes to inking because if I'm thinking too much while I'm laying down that final line work, that final inked line work, I'm going to lose the energy within the line that I'm looking for, the final aesthetic that I'm trying to capture within that that definitive presentation of the work. And that's really where I want my focus to be at that point. I want to be thinking about the quality of the line, not necessarily the elements that themselves that I'm inking. All of that stuff should be worked out. It should be 100% cemented down. Of course, I say 100%, but there is always still room to change as you progress throughout your illustrations. But for me, if I can kind of sort out most of the the underlying structure and get a solidified blueprint to work off of when it comes to the inks, I'm going to feel much more comfortable during those final stages. I find a lot of the time when it comes to comic book illustration in general, the challenge a lot of the time is just having a manageable process that you can go through each and every time pencil or pen goes to paper, or whether you're working traditionally or digitally, that you can depend on. You can start out in the same way each and every time, regardless of the idea that you're trying to get down onto the page, and you can go through a consistent series of steps in order to get to your final destination without having to leave it up to chance. For me, that was why it was so important to develop a solidified, dependable process in the first place. I wanted that consistency. I wanted that predictability so that when I follow that process, I could have the best chance of success possible. And 
I would waste a minimal amount of time setting out on projects, on pieces that just, you know, may have been flawed from the beginning or just may not have ended up turning out the way that I wanted them to in the end because of a a lack of planning, a lack of understanding how I worked as an individual artist. And your process is very much individual to you. Everybody works in their own way. We all find different approaches more comfortable than others. And what I like to do when it comes to working on my illustrations may not feel quite right for you as an artist. It may not quite click for you. So you've really got to figure out through trial and testing, you know, you've got to be willing to actually have a go to get your hands dirty and to try this stuff out for yourself. Um, And if you do that, what you'll find is what works for you and what doesn't work. You'll figure out the things that you'd like to keep within your art that do serve you and your process and that final end result. And you'll also figure out the things that maybe just add more time to the production process or don't quite give you the final result that you're looking for within your work. A lot of the things that I've cut out personally have just been additional little details that, you know, even though my work, funnily enough, is still very, very detailed, um, that just didn't really add a whole lot to my art and, in fact, muddied things up. And you got to understand that there's certain ways of approaching detail, for example, that will give you a very busy, very uh, congested look to the, the visual representation of your ideas. And then there are approaches to detailing that will help you to achieve a more balanced looking piece at the end of the day that still has that level of intricacy and visual interest that you're looking for. And it just all depends on what you figured out along the way that is going to to allow you to achieve that. As I said, some people work really well with certain processes and others simply don't. You've got to figure that stuff out for yourself. And that's kind of what sets us apart from one artist to the next. It also sets our work apart from one another. You can be as inspired as you want to be by the artists out there who you look up to and you admire. But if your work looks exactly the same as theirs, and, you know, really it never will, but if it looks super similar and there's really no differences, no uniqueness about you that separates you as an artist, then it's it's going to feel contrived. There won't be any genuineness about it that the viewer, the audience, can connect with. And make no mistake, it is those out there who have put the time into developing their own unique and distinct style that gained the biggest fan bases because they found their own path. They were inspired, yes, and they were influenced by very, very great artists that came before them. But then they took what they loved the most from those previous creators and they gave it their own spin. They built upon that in order to make it their own. And that is really the key. So you can see that I've gone ahead and on the very loose draft layer that I created previously, I've turned it to blue using the layer color function within Manga Studio. Now I know that Manga Studio is now known as Clip Studio Paint, but I'm still using the old version. I'm using Manga Studio uh, 5, I believe it is called. And so I still call it Manga Studio. I'm still used to it being called that. Um, So if you're looking for it now and you, you think this program might aid you in your own artistic process, then what you want to be looking for online is Clip Studio Paint because that's that's going to give you essentially the new and improved version of the program that I'm using here. I've just been too lazy to update the thing. But I've turned the draft layer to blue and now I'm working over the top of that and I'm laying in those more defined pencils. Now, by no means... Are these pencils 100% polished and finished? They're still quite rough, actually. It's just that I'm capturing much more of a a detailed, intricate representation of 
the character's design, of the details that are going to go into the background elements. I really want to capture the look of everything so that once more when I go in with the G pen later on and I start inking everything out, I'm able to do so knowing that everything that I needed to think about as far as the, the concept for this cover goes has been sorted before the fact. And then that way I can focus just on getting those inks to look right, which is really where my focus needs to be when it comes to inking, because it's really about capturing those smooth, sharp, energetic, very clean, very neat lines when it comes to the final inked line work. And if you're not able to do that, that's when you're going to find that your inks kind of suffer and do somewhat of an, in some cases, injustice to your pencils. It took me a very long time to capture an aesthetic for my inks that measured up to and did justice to my pencils. If you've never really inked before, you're not a seasoned inker, you may have found yourself that the first time you set out to do it, the pencils often look a lot better than the final inks, which is something that you don't want because it kind of defeats the purpose of going out there and inking your penciled line work. Why wouldn't you just leave it as pencils if inking it just in the end took down the quality and diminished the quality of those pencils? That's certainly not something that you want. So I'm going in with a very small pencil brush. I'm using the darker pencil in Manga Studio. The settings are pretty much just dialed to default. I didn't really touch them. This is the default darker pencil tool within Manga Studio. The way in which I'm getting these very thin lines down onto the page is because I've simply sized my brush to a very, very small scale, which means I'm able to along with the pressure that I'm applying to the canvas as I draw, I'm able to get these very subtle lines down on the page that really do bring about this, this penciled sketch-like appearance. And it looks traditional to me. It, it does not look digital, unless, of course, you zoom in. Then you can kind of see the more digital-looking aspects specs of the uh, of the digital pencil tool pencil tool within Manga Studio but yeah when you're looking at it from this distance it it looks very very traditional and i like that and it feels traditional actually a lot of the time you know i feel like i can just loosely sketch things up with this and it feels comfortable that's one of the things that i love the most about manga studio is it is a digital application that allows you to pull off these amazing illustrations, but it it allows you to do that um, working in a, tr in a very traditional way. Like you're able to capture this beautifully traditional looking appearance to your artwork. And a lot of the time people can't tell the difference between my digital work and my traditional work. But I can tell you now that most of the work that I do these days is all digital. Once I went digital, I never really looked back. It was uncomfortable at first. I'll admit that. In fact, the first time I tried to go digital, I really felt so uncomfortable that I was going to give up straight away. I did not like how it felt. It was awkward. And it was not something that I thought would be worth investing my time into in order to get good at it enough so that I could pull off the kind of work I saw other digital artists doing. But I knew that if I if I wanted to pull off work that was to the same level of quality, then I ultimately had to bite the bullet, go in there, get good at using these tools, and hopefully at some point master them. And I've managed to do that now, to the point where it feels genuinely more comfortable to work digitally than it does to work traditionally. The other advantage to working digital that I've found is that it's more cost effective in the long run. The tablet I'm using is uh, is a tablet actually that uh, I got from one of the first universities I ever worked at. Funnily enough, I, I borrowed it, and um, you know that particular 
uh, faculty within the university ended up closing down, and I, I unfortunately never had the the chance to return it. But I've had this thing for like ten years, right? Over ten years, and so um, it has really served me along the way for an extremely long time without the need for an upgrade. I've also, of course, always been using Manga Studio for years and years now. Uh, the same version of the application. I haven't really updated it. I haven't been bothered to update it, rather. I still use Photoshop uh, CS6, I believe, but for a long time I was using CS2 before that. And I remember I was using that for years and years. All of these different versions of the applications, they essentially do the same thing. Uh, they allow you to achieve the same results. Yes, there are minor upgrades to those applications that are added in later on, but they really don't make a huge difference in terms of how the overall application works. So you don't need the latest version of everything. And the tablet I'm using is just an Intuos 3. It's, an, it's a Wacom Intuos 3. It doesn't have any of the fancy... Um, things that you'd get on a Cintiq. I can't see what I'm drawing on it. <laughs> I've got to look at the screen while I'm moving my hand, which is, of course, always awkward in the beginning, but now I'm super used to that. In fact, when I am working traditionally now on pencil and paper, my hand is just getting in the way because I'm, I'm looking at the page while I'm drawing with my hand on the page and it's kind of obscuring my point of view a little bit. So, yeah, I mean... You get good at whatever you're doing with the tools that you've got at your disposal, and you get used to them over time. It's just something that you've got to make sure you're putting the hours required into in order to be, at, be able to get comfortable, to get to know how you work with those tools. Because we all kind of work with them differently in some ways. Like the way in which, for example, I size my brush and the amount of pressure that I apply to my tablet as I draw. That's kind of something that I discovered worked for me through the process of just putting the stylus to the tablet and getting the output on the screen, right? I had to calibrate based on that output. I had to see what I was able to achieve by taking action and then figure out what I needed to do if that wasn't the result that I was looking for to ensure that it was. And so it's a lot of exploration. But the fun part is, is that you're exploring how you personally like to work. So it's a, it's a lot of getting to know yourself, which, you know, beyond doing your artwork and, and the fun that comes with that, the challenges that come with that, it's also a very, very personal experience as far as your own self-development, at least to an extent. I know that's maybe taking it a little bit too far, but I feel as though that my artwork, being as close to me as it has been throughout all these years, has, has in fact helped me to develop as a person. It's increased my ability to be patient. It's increased my ability to be dedicated to something, to see it through to the end, to always put my best foot forward. And, uh, you know, again, you do, you do get good at what it is you do most. And so all of the, the things that go into creating a piece of artwork, not just on the page, but also through you as you're working, through your mind, through your body, through your soul, if you, if you will, all of that is also getting programmed into you. It's getting cemented into your personality. And so... You know, over time, my focus has significantly improved because of that. And I know, I, I can guarantee that every time I set out to do an illustration, it's going to be the, done to the very best of my ability. Because if you half-ass things, if you don't put your best foot forward, if you're always trying to take shortcuts, then you're going to get really, really good at taking shortcuts all the time. You won't have the capacity needed in order to really push yourself beyond your own capabilities and to do something truly groundbreaking. So now that I've got 
Chief Baron done on the front cover. You can see that a lot of his design has now been fleshed out. It's a much clearer representation than we were able to capture within the draft. So that's really fantastic. I'm happy with how he is looking. Chief Baron is the main character within Kozor issue one, Descent into Madness. And this book was written and illustrated by, by my brother Corey initially. And because we've decided to go ahead and crowdfund it, to print it and to publish it for the very first time, Corey and I have decided to completely remaster all of the artwork within the book. And we're also going to go back and re-edit some of the dialogue as well as creating a brand new special edition cover for this definitive version of Kozor, which is where I come in. I'm actually going in over the top of Corey's artwork within the interior of the book from one page to the next, and I'm tweaking the line art. I'm re-inking some, in, some of the panels entirely in different cases. I'm also recalibrating the colors, making sure that they're balanced and harmonized correctly to ensure that any reader who picks up this book is going to get the very, very best version of Kozor that we could possibly create. Um, and of course, you know, if you're wondering how you get it, we're actually going to be launching the campaign for Kozor issue one at the end of next month, end of July. So we've got about a month and a bit to go before that goes up. And so we're really looking forward to it. This will be our first ever campaign, and we're excited to get Kozor into the hands of, of the rest of the world because we're the only ones who have really ac had access to this book. We're the only people who have been able to enjoy the story. So we want everybody else to be able to enjoy it as well. Um, you know, Corey was kind of reluctant to put Kozor out there at first until I said that, hey man, you know what, I'm going to go back and I'm going to help you out. I'm going to make sure that it's in the best possible condition that we can get it in before we release this, this to the rest of the world. So he was a lot more confident about doing so after that. And that's the plan. But, uh, you know, the characters within Kozor is really what attracts me to the book the most. And as I was saying, Chief Baron here, one of the main characters within the book, you know, the story follows him, is just a total beast. He's a badass. He is, um, <laughs> he's, well, he's a rude character. Um, he really doesn't have a lot of compassion or love for anybody. Um, he's, he's a very, He's a grizzled warrior, you could say. That's the best way that I could put it. He's a grizzled warrior. He uh, He's essentially a, like emotionless. He's got a little bit of love for his daughter, though. Um, but that's about it. You know, this guy, he's, he's, he's been through a few rounds. He's, he's lost a lot of people that he loves. Being a grizzled warrior, you're going to end up mind crushing a lot of your feelings and emotions in order to do the things that you need to do in order to survive in a in a violent malevolent world but i really wanted to capture the essence of chief baron within this cover and i was very delighted when corey said to me that i had indeed managed to achieve that and what i love about this representation of chief baron is that he looks mean. He looks scary and intimidating. He's just, he's walking towards you here like he is about to tear you apart. And I'm just so grateful that I was able to get that out onto the page. You never really know how anything is going to go when it, it begins, <laughs> when you start out doing an illustration. You hope for the best and you've got every intention that this thing that you're creating is going to hopefully be as desirable to the audience as it is to you. You want it to be something that people appreciate, that gets people excited, that gets them pumped up. You know, this is the cover of our comic books. So of course, we want to attract people. We want to pull them into the story before they even open up the first page. 
but you just never know whether or not it's going to work out. Even for myself, I I didn't quite know where this cover was going to go, but you just don't until you actually start working on it. And I like that because it means that a lot of the time it's a surprise. You know, when your expectations, whether they be good or bad, end up being derailed and redirected into a completely different place, it's uh, it's a surprise, you know. And a lot of the time, my expectations are not huge for my artwork. I do have high expectations for myself in that way. I always make sure that, hey, whatever I'm going to put out there, it's got to be my very, very best. But... Um, you know, whether or not that that is the case in the end, <laughs> whether it ever goes out in the first place, because I won't put out anything that isn't something that I feel is my very best work. That's why it takes me so long to do these illustrations sometimes, because for me to be satisfied with them, it takes a lot. There's a lot of tweaking that happens. And you can see here, as I try to get this headshot of Chief Baron here, this is a representation of him without his uh, fishman mask, um, this is just going to be his head, his face, but you can see that as I shade it, I'm, I'm constantly retweaking that rendering, constantly rerouting those cross hatches in order to make sure the forms are reading just right, and there's about a million ways in which I could do this. There's not just one way to go about it. It's not like I can follow a clear series of steps here in order to reach the outcome that I'm looking for. I've just got to keep on going and keep on experimenting, hope for the best. If it doesn't look just right, I erase it and I take a different approach. And sometimes the mistakes I make along the way are not evident to me in the beginning. When I first go through and I start illustrating things out, I can't see where the illustration has ended up derailing. And so it takes me some time. It takes me oftentimes time away from the drawing board in order to be able to see those mistakes as they are. And the funny thing is, is that when I do come back to the drawing board after some, a few hours away, it, it could even just be like a 10 minute break where I go to make a coffee and I come back, I sit down and I have another closer look at what it is I've been putting together. And the mistakes are blaringly obvious. The flaws are entirely evident. And uh, it scares me because why didn't I see that when I was working on it? And the answer is, it's because I was working just so close. You know, you've got to make sure that you step back every now and then in order to get that fresh perspective that all of us artists need. You know, otherwise, we do get that tunnel vision. We just become blind to um, the the overall concept rather than the the individual details that we're so focused on at the time. You know, all of this rendering is all good and well. All of these cross hatches that I've laid in, sure, they they are working on their own, but do they work with the rest of the illustration? That is the question. And the only way for me to determine that is a lot of the time to make sure that I am taking a break making sure that I'm able to collect myself. And, and having a break is good for me physically anyway. You know, with a detailed illustration like this, I can tell you my hand hurts by the end of the day. It really does. Like, it's it's swollen. I've got um, calluses that are beginning to form. It's not great. If you look at my hands, they are very much artists' hands. And in some cases, I've got to dip them in, like, warm water, uh, put them under cold water and then dip them in warm water again just to get them back to being normal. And I don't know how long I'm going to be able to draw like this for. It worries me a lot. 
the amount of fatigue my hands can feel at the end of a complex illustration like this. And it makes me wonder if I shouldn't kind of take my foot off of the detail accelerator once in a while and, uh, you know, maybe um, ease up on all the rendering, ease up on all those little itty-bitty details and go for a bit more of a simpler presentation. A presentation that still captures my style, but maybe leaves out some of the uh, the more complex intricacies. So you can see his face is fully rendered out now. I really like the way that it has turned out. Um, with a face like that, where you've got the lighting coming in, almost from the back, but at the side as well, where the cheekbones are falling into shadow at the front there. That is, uh, that's not always an easy lighting setup for me to capture, especially when you're talking about a face, because there's so many different subtle forms that you're dealing with that are defined by the bones, the underlying muscle structure of the face, and to really get it looking right, you would hope that there was a, a clear step-by-step -step approach that you could take, but a lot of it is just depending on your eye and being able to judge what looks right and what looks wrong and going somewhat more with your intuition. Now, in order to help me out with that, when it came to rendering and shadowing this headshot of Chief Baron, I made sure that I actually had some photo references of people whose heads were placed underneath a similar light situation, a similar light source, where the light was coming from behind and a portion of the front of their face was falling in the shadow. Again, the front of the cheekbones, um, you know, even underneath the nose as well. And I wanted to see how the light would uh, project down onto the character and then the shadows would collect around the eye sockets too. You know, all of this is something that is very difficult to store inside your mind alone. It's very difficult to remember it. And so you do need those references there to ensure that you're you're capturing everything you need to capture with the utmost accuracy. Now, it doesn't have to be completely accurate. There is still some room to move. We are working with comic book illustrations here. And so you're going to be looking at a stylized representation of reality regardless. But still, at the same time, the closer you can get things to look accurate, things to look correct by ensuring that there is some consistencies with reality, uh, that's what's going to enable you to create a true connection with the audience and to suspend their disbelief. Because if there's too many inaccuracies, if reality looks one way and yet in your comic book and the way in which you're representing your characters, that reality has inconsistencies within it, that's when people are going to become disconnected. And don't get me wrong, by the way, like you can have whatever crazy style you want. You can have completely out of whack proportions and anatomy, kind of like The Simpsons or any wacky cartoon out there that w many people have fallen in love with over the years, over the decades. But what matters is that consistency. If in that reality, if in that world, all the all the characters are yellow, um, then you've got to make sure, or, you know, whatever whatever colors their skin tones are going to be, then you've got to make sure that there's, there's not going to be some random, like, other character that walks in that's, that's not yellow. Or, you know, I think, I do believe they have brown characters as well in The Simpsons and, and a variety of different races and backgrounds. But, uh, you know, it would be like if an, if an alien just randomly walked onto the scene... If it worked within that reality, sure, people might not raise an eye, an eyebrow. They, they'll accept it. But in order for them to accept that it's part of that reality, it almost has to be pre, pre-suggested, predetermined to an extent. So, you know, all of that is just a long way of saying to make sure that whatever you decide to do for your characters, that you stick with it. The way in which you represent them, the way in which you show them, even if it is a little bit weird, just make sure that, especially when it comes to the interiors of your comic book, if you're drawing, you know, Chief Baron, for example, here in one way, in one panel, then he's got to look that way within the next panel. 
This is one thing I had to get onto Corey's case about because when I was drawing up Chief Baron here, I noticed that when I was reading the book itself, gathering these references of Chief Baron, that he'd be drawn in one way in panel one and then in a completely different way in panel four. And uh, that's a problem because maybe we don't notice it as the artists, as we're creating it for the same reason that I mentioned before. We just get too involved with the work that we're doing. But the reader will. And what is the what is the worst thing that can happen when it comes to your reader's engagement is them losing that suspense of disbelief. That's what's going to take them out of the story. So I'm going through, I'm dropping in shadows, I'm loosely placing down the rendering, and even though I may not follow everything to the T when it comes to the inks, I am going to make sure that I stick pretty close to what I'm doing here in the penciling stage. Um, you know, I, there's always definitely room to explore various alter alternatives when it comes to the inking portion of the illustration. You know, if something is not working that you only notice later on, then of course, don't stick with the thing that's not working in the pencils. You need to adjust that in the inks to ensure that that end presentation is on point. Always know that there's, there's time to go back, that just because you've laid something down onto the page, especially when we're talking digital, always know that you can change things up. It's, it's never too late. And it's always best to do that, at least in my opinion. It depends if you're working for a studio. I know that they've got deadlines to meet and there's going to be more than just you who needs to get things done. And for example, if you're getting your pencils in late, that means your inker is going to be getting their inks in late. And so you've got to make sure that you're... you're Considering everybody else who is involved with the comic book project, the comic book publisher is going to have promises that they've made with the stores, with the people printing the book, with the people distributing the book. So they're depending on you to get the job done. So I get that, you know. If you make a big mistake and you just don't have the time to go back and fix it, then sometimes you've just got to, you know, live with it and submit what you've got even if it's not perfect. It's un unfortunate when you have to do that as an artist because it feels like you're sacrificing a little bit of your soul when you do that. But I guess in the end, uh, you've got to figure out what fights you're going, to, uh, you're going to pick. And when it comes to your own stuff, I think that it is worth going back and redoing things if need be. Because, you know, with Kozor here, we're creating a certain reputation for the book. We're creating a certain expectation for the quality that people are going to be expecting within it. And if we can set that expectation high, if we can deliver something that really excites people, that really gets them pumped, and we've got complete control over that, then that's totally worth embracing. So we are going to take the time that's needed in order to produce the very best book that we possibly can. We're not going to take shortcuts here because we know that in the end, this is going to cause the book to suffer. We're not in it necessarily to make money. Of course, if we can raise enough money to keep on doing comic books, that would be amazing. But in the end, what matters most to us is creating a great looking story with amazing looking artwork that the reader can enjoy, that the reader can, as I said, get obsessed with, get excited about and, you know, that's the kind of comics that Corey and I grew up with when we were younger. This is what made Image Comics so appealing to us. You know, the art of Todd McFarlane with Spawn and Mark Silvestri's Cyberforce. Um, even Rob Liefeld's Youngblood. These comic books were so exciting. They were visually eye-capturing and that's what pulled people in. We want to do the same thing here for Kozor and, you know, the projects that I work on later, Renegade Alpha. I am working on Renegade Alpha still. It's just that at the moment, Kozor is kind of my focus here since that's the first campaign we've got coming up. But after that, I'm going to be continuing on with Renegade Alpha and, you know, it's still a long way off. But 
make no mistake, that is definitely in the works. The entire comic book has been drafted up already in a similar capacity to what you're seeing here with the cover for Kozor. So all I got to do is just complete the character concepts for it and jump into it. But back to the Kozor cover, here on the front of the book, what you're going to see is a bit of a montage, actually, that represents a scene that happens near the beginning of the book where um, we're seeing this demon, Magator, that's kind of getting inside the head of Chief Baron in the hopes of slowly manipulating him into doing his bidding, right? And even I don't know exactly how the story is going to go entirely. I know what happens in the first issue, but long term... I don't know what Magator's full intentions are for Chief Baron. Corey hasn't told me completely. He's left me clues, but he's very good at not giving anything away. In fact, a really cool thing is, though, that Corey has pretty much illustrated issue two of Kozor already, and it's twice as long as issue one, which is pretty mental. Like, I'm super excited about that because the artwork he's done for it is also even better. It's one of the reasons I'm going through and upgrading the artwork for issue one. Uh, but yeah, both of these books are going to be great. And the, the great news is that you won't have to wait too long for issue two once you get issue one. So um, if you like the first book, you're definitely going to love the second book and you're not going to have to wait for it too long. But on the front of the cover here, what I'm working on now, you can see uh, this guy who's surrounded by these these two female figures, and he's essentially been built into this crystal-like structure. Now, this character is, in fact, Kozor, right? And even though we don't see a lot of him in issue one, he is definitely going to become a major player throughout the comic book. Obviously, we've called the comic book Kozor for a reason. He's a very, very powerful character. I'm not going to give anything away. People hate it when I give away spoilers as much as I love to. I'm going to restrain myself here, but he is an extremely powerful character, and uh, and you will see why in the story uh, when you check it out. But um, I wanted to include him here because he is such a pinnacle portion of the book, and he's uh, he's kind of like, even though he's the main guy in the story, he's kind of like the MacGuffin of the story. In other words, he's like the Ring and Lord of the Rings, or, um, you know, you know, he's not, he's not, he's the center of the story, but the story itself is more about the characters surrounding him, such as Chief Baron here. And so, Corey kind of explained it to me in the way that, you know. It, it, the story plays out like Game of Thrones, right? Game of Thrones is about it's about the throne within Game of Thrones, but it's more about the characters within that story, right? So, yeah, there's a lot of players within Kozor, a lot of characters that um, you're going to get invested in and then, very Game of Thrones style, end up losing. Um, along the way, which I'm just going to say, again, I'm not giving away spoilers, but the first issue of Kozor has a pretty shocking ending. That's all I'm going to say. And even I was surprised when I read it. But, uh, you know, again, I'm not going to ruin it for anybody who's interested in this story. If you are interested, be sure to click the link in the description below and check it out. Sign up to the pre-launch list because um, you are going to be able to get access to a whole bunch of exclusive VIP rewards when you back on day one and when you're on the list, including exclusive posters. I would love to do a poster for this cover. I think that's going to be really, really great. Uh, and once it's all inked up, it's going to look even more epic. But it's going to be full color as well. Um, we're doing a black and white version of the comic book, so I'm probably going to put a black and white version of this cover on that, which means you can pick up the black and white version and the color version if you would like to. 
It's just that Corey's artwork is so intricate and so dramatic just with the, the line art alone that we thought it'd be really cool to try this out. It'd be really cool to have a black and white comic book that uh, that people could could have access to, that people could read. We're still not sure how it's going to turn out or how it's going to look, but we think it's a pretty cool idea. Um, we're also going to have the original version of Kozor as a reward that you can get too if you're interested because Corey's artwork in its original form um, is something which is going to be, a, you know, eventually a rarity. It'll likely be a very limited run. The the very original, I guess you could almost think of it as a beta version of Kozor. Um, it'll be a collector's item. It'll be something that is probably only going to be accessible within this campaign. I doubt that we'll, uh, we'll release it again, but we thought that'd be something that people might find interesting. So yeah, definitely check it out. But back to what's happening here on the screen. Jumping into Kozor, I'm going going through... Not Kozor, Magator. <laughs> I'm going through and I'm articulating some of the finer details within his design. Now what I wanted here was some dramatic shadowing. Uh, something that really brought across the nightmarish vibe that I wanted this demon to have. So... I'm drawing it out with contours, but I'm also drawing him out with shadows as well. I'm really trying to keep the lighting in mind as I lay down these this line work. So I'm thinking about where the shadows are going to fall. And of course, I've got a bunch of different references up for Magator to make sure that I'm capturing his character design as closely as possible. I know that this really mattered a lot to Corey. He wanted to make sure that the the true essence of all these characters were present and and properly uh, represented within the cover. So I've, uh, I've definitely tried my best to make sure that that is the case. And I wasn't initially going to add this much detail to the cover, but I'm glad that I did. Because in the end, even though it's going to take a while, even though it's going to take more than a while, actually, I am assuming I'm going to be working on this cover for a month or more. Yes, I'm a slow artist, unfortunately. Um, but if I want to capture this kind of quality to my work, then I've got no choice. I've got to go ahead and I've got to do do the time required. I've got to pay my dues to get the kind of artwork that uh, that I'm able to create. And so this is one of the reasons that I don't take on many commissions, to be honest with you, because the amount of time it takes me is, quite frankly, ridiculous sometimes, depending on the amount of detail that's involved with it. It depends what the client wants. You know, sometimes they want something really simple. Sometimes they just want, you know, a, a female character on a cover. With a minimal amount of rendering, the design may be quite simple. And so it doesn't take long at all. But something like this, you know, a double wrap around back to front cover is going to require a lot of hours to be put into it. And so, you know, that is something that is much more expensive and much more time consuming and probably not. You know, it really depends on, again, what the client is after. Ultimately, if they want something like this, then I guess I've got to got to tell them what the deal is <laughs> you know but it's again it's more of a time factor for me money is is not a huge motivator unfortunately it makes me a very bad businessman you know i've got to be really interested in what it is i'm working on in order to do it i've got to have my heart in it i've got to have a lot of passion behind it in order to do a good job in order to enjoy the process of actually working on it and there's very few things that uh, i do in my life that isn't enjoyable. Like I, I intentionally have devised uh, my lifestyle to work on things that I find fulfilling, to work on things that I am going to, you know, get something out of more than just the monetary value. Something a little bit more in intrinsic, I guess you could say. And I know that sounds all mysterious and strange but you know really that's that's why I create my art because I enjoy it because I have fun with it 
if I didn't have fun, then there would be no point in being an artist. I could do something else. If it was just for the money, let me tell you, there's a lot of different ways I could make money that are a lot easier than this. And I would say for anybody who is looking to get into comic books, it's a good idea to make sure that you love the craft first and foremost, because if you don't love the craft, each and every day is going to be torture for you. You could have more fun flipping burgers and macas than doing comic book art, if indeed your heart wasn't in it. So if this is something you're going to do, you've got to make sure that you love it, that it's it's every it's your dream, that you just wouldn't be you without it, that your life wouldn't be fulfilled wouldn't be lived to the fullest without being a comic book artist. And that may sound overly dramatic once more, but I'm telling you, that is definitely the case because there's going to be plenty of days where you're stuck at the drawing board more hours than you would be working at a regular nine to five job. Let's turn that up to like, you know, rather than an eight hour day, it's going to probably be a, a 10 hour day, maybe even a 16 hour day, depending on how hardcore you are. And it's going to require a lot of energy. There's not going to be a lot of time to do anything else. Um, it's going to be difficult to catch up with friends, to go out partying, to to even, you know, do the good things, the, the, the things that, that allow you to keep your well-being intact, like going to the gym, going for a walk. There are some days where you're going to have such tight deadlines if you're working for a studio or other people where you've just got to stick at it until that drawing is done. You're going to lose sleep, um, which is, again, why ideally I like working for myself, although I probably haven't reached or gained the amount of success that I could potentially gain if I pushed myself even harder than I already do. Um I feel like you're you're sacrificing just too much if if you burn yourself out. If you push yourself to the limit like that and you sacrifice your relationships in life, if you sacrifice your well-being, no amount of money is going to make that worthwhile, at least in my opinion. So for me, working for myself and taking my time, loving what I do, making sure that I have, even though I'm working on this full time, ensuring that the the love and the care and the the profound amount of passion that I have for comic book art is still intact is at the top of my list of priorities. Because it, it, when you're working on this stuff full time, it can become like any other job. It can become tedious, time consuming, and before you know it, you're looking at the clock, wondering, you know, when is this going to end? When am I going to be able to clock off here? And if you feel that way about comic book art, I think that's when there is a problem. So set yourself up in such a way where the artwork that you do is not necessarily dependent on whether or not you can pay the bills at the end of the day. You should have some, I would even say, a decent amount of savings stored away before you start a comic book project, just in my opinion. Because if... If you're depending on that for an income, um, and it's everything is is relying on that, all of a sudden, the love that you have for comic book art and creating a comic book project becomes something else entirely. It becomes a it becomes something that you have been tasked with, something that you've been burdened with, rather than something that you actually want to do just for the love of it. And it's great to have the kind of financial success that we see other creators receive on their comic book projects. That's wonderful. But, you know, ultimately, you've got to make sure that your heart's in the right place with this stuff. Because if it's not, you're going to burn out really, really quickly. And the comic book that you're hoping to create will not become a reality because you'll tap out, you'll give up, right? If you've got love for this, there's nothing that can stop you. Right, if you've got an unending, depthless amount of passion for what it is you're working on, you're invincible, right? So don't make don't make it a job. Sure, try to try to make it profitable in some way, but 
don't make it a job, a task, something that you would only do because you're being paid to do it. You know, comic book can't be like that because, <laughs> as I said, there's a lot easier way to make money. You may as well just do something else. You know, a lot of the time you'll find people who create comic books are doing it out of love for their craft, for their ideas, and that's what makes them unstoppable, unstoppable enough for them to eventually reach that success because it's not going to happen straight away. Let me tell you that. No matter how confident you are, no matter how talented you are even, that success is not going to come to you straight away. It's at least definitely not a guarantee. And if it does happen, then, you know, I mean, it's a, everything is a little bit of luck. Everything is a little bit of intention. If you're strategic about the way in which you approach these things, if you're strategic about the way in which you network with other creators and promote yourself, then, yeah, I mean, you're, you're definitely increasing your chances of success. But even then, there's no guarantees. And you've got to be prepared for that. You've got to understand that. And the best place to be mentally is to know deep within yourself that even if your comic book project wasn't a financial success, you could have a printed comic book sitting in your hands and that would be enough. That would be enough to have all the time and all the energy that you committed to it, that you dedicated to it, be worth it. Right? And that's kind of the place you need to be at. Because as if you can simply get your comic book done, then that's an achievement. And that's something that isn't dependent on anything else. It's not dependent on you know other people buying that book. It's dependent on you. You've got complete control over that. And if you're able to be fulfilled simply by creating your comic book alone, then it means that you, you're already setting out on the right track. It means that if you see a little bit of success from that, you'll be willing to continue forth to create that next book. And the more books that you create, the better you're going to get at your craft and the more of a chance there's going to be for that success to happen. So just keep that in mind. It's something which is important to consider and something which is really going to serve you in a great capacity later on down the line when you do eventually build up the courage to jump in and just start your comic book because it does take courage it does take commitment and it's it's something that i promise you will be worth it in the end if you're willing to go all the way so that completes today's demonstration i hope that you enjoyed it this is part one of the penciling process for the Kozor wrap around cover. We've so far completed the front. We've completed a little bit of the back. In the next video, you are going to see me bring this home, complete the pencils, and uh, and do up the rest of it. Essentially, readying it for the inking stage, which is going to be a whole lot of fun. Don't worry, you're going to see the whole process behind that as well. Again, if you're interested in checking out Kozor, I highly suggest that you visit our pre-launch page and sign up to the mailing list. We're launching in a little bit over a month, so uh, it's, it's coming up real quick and you're not going to want to miss out because if you're back on day one and you're on the mailing list, you're going to, you're going to get some exclusive little perks that no one else is going to get. But it's only going to be accessible to you if you're back on day one. The only way that you're going to know when this campaign launches is if you're on that mailing list. So get on a pronto if you hear what I'm saying. <laughs> if you'd like more comic art tips, tricks, and tutorials, of course, be sure to visit www.howtodrawcomics.net. You'll find a bunch of written tutorials, video tutorials. You've even got a podcast. When you're ready to upgrade your comic art skill set, I highly suggest that you check out our store. We've got a range of courses covering a variety of topics within it, and uh, and I can assure you that there's probably something there for you if uh, you're looking to, to level up your drawing abilities. Other than that, if you'd like to keep 
in touch with us and you'd like to keep up to date on everything that we're doing with our comic book projects, Corey and I, as well as Rob the Replicator, be sure to visit www.bartonbrosstudios.com. We've got a range of different interviews with various creators over on the site that you can check out. And we've also got a blog that we post updates on every now and then concerning our comic book projects, such as Kozal, such as Renegade Alpha. So I hope to see you there. Until next time, keep on creating, keep on drawing, and I'll catch you in the next video.